Good evening, everyone. My name is Joseph Campana. I'm a professor of English here at Rice University, and I direct the Center for Environmental Studies and co-direct the Environmental Studies minor. Um, and so I'm pleased to welcome you tonight to our latest episode of Planet Now, Conversations in Environmental Studies. Our webinars emphasize a habit of conversation across disciplines and across audiences about important questions facing us right now. We plan these sessions in conversation with the ENST curriculum. So shout out to Prepared Air, and we'll hear more about that in just a moment. Um, I also wanna say our events are free, open to the public. Um, whenever possible, we record these conversations as we will be tonight um, and make them available online also for free. And you can find previous episodes at ents.rice.edu backslash event hyphen videos. And that link will be in the chat in just a moment. I've been looking forward to tonight's webinar, Prepared Air, for some time because it emerged from a conversation with my excellent colleagues in the School of Architecture, especially Juan Jose Castillon and Liz Galvez, the latter of whom you'll hear from in just a moment. Um, and I'm even more delighted to welcome tonight Salman Craig, Rafael Benitez Duran, and Heather Davis, who Liz will introduce also in just a moment. First, a few acknowledgments. Um, Rice University is located in the sprawling city of Houston on the Gulf Coast of Texas. And we acknowledge we live on the ancestral lands of the Karankawa, the Sana, the Kuitilkan, and the Atacapa Ishak. I also want to make some institutional acknowledgments. Um, as I said earlier, the Center for Environmental Studies, and I'll say something about this again in a moment, is located in the schools of architecture and humanities. I'm delighted to thank um, for their incredible support, Deans Igor Marjanovic and Kathleen Canning. I also want to thank our um, the co my co-parent of the Planet Now series, co-director of the Environmental Studies Curriculum, Richard Johnson, Rice's Executive Director for Sustainability. He directs the Administrative Center for Sustainability and Energy Management here in Rice. Um, he has been with the Inst Inst Curriculum since its beginning um, and has taught over two dozen classes in it, including um, this spring, of course, Sustainable Futures. I also want to thank someone who is behind the scenes <laughs> tonight, um, uh, Weston Twardowski, uh, the project manager for the Deluvio Houston grant funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Um, Weston's an expert in theater, about to be a PhD um, from Northwestern, and he hails from the Gulf Coast and works to build environmental networks amongst artists and advocates around the city and the region. Um, and I'll also say one last thing, a shout out to some of our community partners. We've been thrilled to develop relationships over the last months um, with Citizens Environmental Coalition, BioCity Waterkeeper, and especially important for tonight's conversation, Air Alliance Houston. Um, the relationships are still young and they're developing, but they are also already so deeply impactful. So I'm grateful to be in conversation with um, Leticia Gutierrez, Ayana Jolivet McLeod, Paige Powell, and Rachel Powers. As I said earlier, um, I'm, and I'm really happy to say, one of the most distinctive things about the Center for Environmental Studies is that we're cited in humanities and in architecture. Um, environmental studies is marked by so many multi and interdisciplinary conversations, um, but the ones I find so powerful are the ones in which approaches to the arts and to the imagination, media, history, philosophy, and religion converse with attention to design, to the living sense of space, and to what we live with and build from. Um, so I'm delighted tonight is also going to be the first of many conversations very directly planned with architecture um, and stay tuned for future ones on water on materials and on many other things. Um, the premise tonight is simple. What happens when a planet full of people, some of whom may take for granted the air they breathe, suddenly, in the face of a global pandemic, think more and more about where air comes from, what's in it, and how it shapes and bodies and lives from within and from without. Of course, so many are already painfully aware that they do not enjoy clean air, air that can just feel transparent because it isn't. Um, with this in mind, Liz um, Wanho and I wondered what would it be like to have a conversation about air from the point of view of architecture, engineering, media and cultural studies, and we'll find out in just a moment. Um, and I'd finally like to say, um, as a poet myself and as a literary critic, um, that I nominate for tonight um, a figure who you he may hear more about from others, um, Gaston Bachelard, a kind of guiding spirit for the conversation. Um, if you don't know, Bachelard is an unbelievably fascinating polymath, um, someone who was a postal clerk and telegraph operator who taught physics and chemistry, which brought him to write about thermodynamics, at which point he realized he needed to understand the history of sciences in conversation with um, the history of the imagination through poetry, philosophy, 
and psychology. That kind of says it all sort of, and, and in a way what we know in environmental studies is that um, the things that we understand and the advances we make come from fitting together the insights of so many different um, disciplines. Um, he wrote stunning and odd and great books, still influential, like The Psychoanalysis of Fire, The Poetics of Space, Water and Dreams, Earth and the Reveries of Will, and relevant for our, to our purposes tonight, Air and Dreams, an essay on the imagination of movement. Um, I could quote from his works all night, but then you'd never hear anything from our distinguished guests, and that would be terrible. Um, so I'll just leave you with two quotes before I turn it over to Liz, um, and that I think are provocations for thinking about, um, thinking about air as a provocation to understand the imagination, and vice versa, right? Whenever we are struck by an image, we should ask ourselves what a torrent of words this image unleashes within us. That's one. The other, Imagination allows us to leave the ordinary course of things. So I'm looking forward to hearing a torrent of images of air from our guests as they draw from their varied interests and expertise, um, and also to learning how these imaginings of air allow us to consider and perhaps then also to leave the ordinary course of things. But first, let me pass things over to Liz Galvez, visiting critic, critic in our School of Architecture, who's teaching this semester a course called Prepared Air. After Liz's remarks, each panelist will take about seven to 10 minutes um, to talk about air from their point of view, followed by some conversations conversation and questions from you in our audience. So Liz, take it away. Great. Thank you, Joe. It's great to um, be here with you all uh, tonight. Uh, I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit how we're taking on the topic of air uh, and what this kind of concept or idea of, of its preparation might mean. Buildings and their mechanical systems, they rely on energy to condition and environ bodies. Due to changing weather and climate trends in combination with the earthly limits of equitably sourced material and energy sources, it is a critical moment to better understand the relationship between ourselves, other living beings, and our environments. The medium of air and its management entangles us all. As breathing beings, humans must be environed by and contained within favorable atmospheric conditions. A building's environmental task can then be thought of as an effort towards a small surrounding of favorable air conditions. In contemporary practice, the techniques of architecture that define and manage these conditions are first, a membrane or enclosure that serves to delineate environments, and two, mechanical technologies which act upon the qualities of the atmosphere itself. Together, these two forms of environmental management, reliant on both fuel and material resources, allow buildings to prepare air for human habitation. More fundamentally, the question of how we design and inhabit our built environments creates an opening to formulate a critique of the status quo, creating opportunities to question and eventually further how we environ the building interior and a return to deeper design thinking in the realm of conditioning our environments and our air. In a time when the global pandemic has made us hyper aware of the air, just as Joe has mentioned, we're asking our guests to come ready to talk about culture, design, and engineering, keeping air in mind in the context of both COVID-19 and the urgencies of our planetary moment, be it with an eye to air pollution, indoor air quality, and comfort, air conditioning, energy utilization, atmospheric changes, the air as a prepared breathing environment for all living beings. Each guest will have the opportunity to share their thinking, followed by an opportunity for questions and discussion. The, pan the panel is co-organized through the Rice Center for Environmental Studies, a joint venture of Rice Architecture, and uh, we're really happy to be part of this conversation. We are joined tonight by Salman Craig, Assistant Professor of Architecture at McGill University, who studies turning biogenetic building materials into heat exchangers, Rafael Benitez Duran, Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Houston, 
and an expert on atmosphere as form in architecture. And Heather Davis, Assistant Professor of Culture and Media at the New School, where her recent work has examined plastic saturation and materiality. Joe and I will moderate the conversation after hearing from each of our guests. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you so much, Joseph. It's sort of comforting and, and weird at the same time to, to know that despite the distance between everyone, we're, we're ultimately sharing the same air bath that is the atmosphere. <laughs> um, I've prepared a few slides. Can, can you see that um, title page? Thank you. Um, so uh, before, before I talk exclusively about my fluids research, I, I, I want to give the context of my, my broader re research program, which it focuses on two main areas. Uh, the first is on natural modes of thermoregulation and ventilation in, in, in buildings, uh, you know, without, without machines, without equipment. And, and the second is on new bio-based uh, building materials for, for long-term carbon storage uh, with, with special thermal functions, the idea being to, to obviate air conditioning. And in both of these areas, I investigate complementary aspects of, of uh, fluid mechanics and, and materials engineering at the interface of in architecture. And the idea is to understand the physical limits of naturally conditioned bio-based buildings in, in different climates, cultures, and, and landscapes. In other words, I ask, uh, can buildings be designed as part of natural carbon cycles with their materials, while also harnessing ambient energy for natural air conditioning? So it, it's worth emphasizing uh, first the wider significance of, of fluid mechanics in, in, in architecture today. Once architects realize, I found, uh, that we all live submerged at the bottom of an ocean of air, they often undergo a deep uh, transformation in outlook. It is no longer possible to consider spaces as empty while sketching plans and sections. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced everyone to reconsider the, the fluid medium we share and breathe, the, the windows we leave shut, the filters that go unchanged, the plumes and currents that convey aerosols and heat around rooms and between us. Not only is it crucial to advance specialist knowledge of how air behaves in buildings, but it's also essential to democratize this understanding among everyone who designs and inhabits them. How we condition and interact with our interior climates has significant implications for society and everyday life from personal and public health energy use and greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels and, and leaking refrigerants. My fluid mechanics research focuses on, what I, uh, on how to design what I call uh, livable temperature cascades. Most modern energy efficient buildings are designed on the premise that all rooms should be thermally comfortable all the time. More and more researchers are starting to challenge this notion, uh, thankfully. For instance, by showing how it would be a grave mistake to erase vernacular knowledge of how to organize interior spaces thermally. In a similar vein, my research group recently published a study on, on the potential of temperature cascades and a design strategy we call thermal nesting. A temperature cascade refers to a series of spaces that are progressively warmer or cooler than the exterior. Meanwhile, thermal nesting refers to architectural configurations that produce these temperature cascades naturally. We think that thermal nesting is a promising alternative for both new buildings and retrofits, but we noticed there were no proper guidelines for how to do it or what the limitations are, physically speaking. So we developed a general thermal model using a previous study by uh, Dr. Chen Vidyagar, and Chen Vidya Khan and Professor Woods of Cambridge University. And their um, fluid bath experiments showed how natural buoyancy flow emerges in a two-step temperature cascade. So buoyancy flow is, is, is the ventilation driven by temperature differences, as you saw with those um, salt bath um, simulations, analog models I showed with the video earlier. So we extended their analysis to end spaces, you know, a cascade of, of however many spaces. Um, and then we used um, adaptive comfort theory and heat stress theory to define cascading temperature thresholds in different climates. The idea is that people should be able to, could or could adapt to seasons and 
uh, heat waves, not by adjusting their thermostat necessarily, but by adjust, um, but by how they inhabit the, the cascade. Uh, our analysis not only defined the sizing rules for well-designed uh, cascades, but it also revealed the potential energy saving and adaptive comfort limits. We found that if you follow the sizing rules properly during early design, thermal nesting can provide more than 50% energy savings relative to a reference building of uniform temperature. And we were also able to point out the pros and cons for different design choices. For instance, when it's worth adding extra steps in the cascade, how to balance the heat recycling be, uh, between spaces, when it's better to ventilate the spaces separately or in a continuous stream, and why nesting might be particularly good for, for retrofitting uh, um, heritage buildings. In my lab, we're, we're setting up a, a new synthetic Schlerin uh, system for visualizing thermally driven uh, airflows. And one of the first experiments we plan to do is to investigate the transition between mixed conditions and stratified conditions in a two-step and three-step temperature cascade. Um, but before that, there's another flow experiment we want to do first, which we've been eagerly waiting to do for, for some time. Professor Anne-Marie Adams, a colleague, a good close colleague at McGill University, a historian, um, both her and I have an uncovered an historic uh, precursor to ventilation heat recovery at the former Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, first built in 1892. Um, the pavilion plan patient wings were cross ventilated in the summer and ventilated by central J tubes in, in the winter. Professor Alan Shorts of Cambridge University has documented how J tubes were widely used for thermally driven ventilation before the advent of mechanical fans but historians haven't yet pieced together the full story of how ventilation heat recovery developed from an innovative architectural response to harsh winter conditions to the standard equipment-based solution, so fun fundamental to modern en energy efficient schemes today. Back in the 19th, late 19th century, the threat of frozen pipework in heating plenums was a real concern in, harsh, in the harsh Montreal winter. The local RVH engineers managed to devise an innovative approach to preheating the incoming air. They did so using an early form of heat recovery. And this cold weather adaptation of the pavilion plan was de developed despite deep set disagreements with Henry Saxon Snell. Snell was a well known British um, specialist in hospital ventilation who proposed the pavilion plan scheme to the client but it seems he had little understanding of local engineering practices or the harsh realities of the Montreal winter. And this generated many conflicts and misunderstandings during the design process. Any professional practicing today would recognize these tensions, especially when reputations are on the line. Having pieced together this history with Professor Adams, we are about to conduct a Schlerin experiment to demonstrate how the heat recovery ventilation system worked. Here's the pilot experiment using salt water to simulate the, the thermosiphon. The way it works is as follows. Fresh air is heated in the plenum in the basement. It rises up naturally to the wards through risers integrated in the walls. Then at the end of the pavilion, a J tube uh, sucks the air back down from the wards, wards into a long trunk running the length of the plenum. And this trunk warmed by the exhaust preheats the fresh air. So the, the the trunk is warm and therefore it preheats uh, uh, the, the fresh air and it's warm because of the exhaust, hence the heat recovery. Using Schlerin, we will be able to demonstrate the heat recovery from the trunk and its effect on the buoyancy flow dynamics. And we'll also be able to examine a new class of heat recovery configurations inspired by the Royal Victoria uh, Hospital. Uh, just to end, I, I want to try and relate this um, uh, to the temperature cascades. But it turns out that if you want heat recovery with buoyancy ventilation without a centralized mechanical infrastructure, then you need to accept temperature, temperature gradients across rooms and spaces. Otherwise, no matter how hard you try, you will never heat, recover heat downstream. If the intake is the same temperature as the exhaust, the flow will stall. And that's what, what I mean when I refer to livable temperature cascades. So one radical proposition is that we design intakes and exhausts as part of the permanent occupied architecture. That is semi-interior and semi-exterior spaces where the partition walls uh, act as heat exchangers. 
Not only could these temperature cascades and flow loops be key to unlocking the full potential of buoyancy ventilation, but they could also unlock the thermal potential of, of, of building of natural building materials. Thank you very much. I guess it's my turn. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, all of you, Joe's, uh, Liz, and it's great to be with you both, Sal and Heather. Uh, it's, it's just a beautiful opportunity for me to talk about my research. Let me share my screen. Um, here it is. Um, sure. Do you see? Okay, great. At the moment, humans uh, have realized the fragility of air chemistry and life by taking consciousness of global warming, even if we might still see the atmosphere as an unfathomable territory. We also have realized that the ordinary is extraordinary. As a contribution to the panel, I wanted to stress the idea of what air is in contrast of what air is supposed to be. When I was in my teenage, allergies produced by gramineus around the school where I received a Krausist education, ironically, if not terrifying, derived on asthmatic episodes. I was commuting from a urban center where my home in Madrid was to the multi-chrome prairies of the school. I was breathing more artificial than natural air. Beyond years of doctor appointments, to treat my asthmatic reactions, I learned from my lungs the meaning of situated air. Humans have taken the right to breathe in the same manner as the right to live. And from this particular perspective, we also have narrowed our bones with air to a biological implication, but it's as, as if breathing well were an expected health parameter. As Sandra Kaji has put it, Quote, air containment is a scientific aspiration, but possibly not a cultural aspiration. What we call air is really a hybrid plurality of actual, actual substances, including the chemical arrangements from the original gases of the primitive atmosphere to present, as well as our exhalation of carbon dioxide, lungs, microbials, and all other substances particles we call aerosol coming from human and non-human emissions, including those that emanates from the many forms of combustions, heating or cooling the house, driving to the grocery, or ordering the skid grilled veggies, and those that return to the atmosphere in the process of warming the permafrost, perhaps methane, and those violently erupted by volcanoes, perhaps Cumbre Vieja. What we are breathing in every inhalation is a substance of present arrangements of our particular environment. The mission of the car waiting the light to turn green in the middle of the street or the pollination of weeds and oak trees and so on. But it's also a millenary substance that has registered a vast quantity of events that go from the massive disruption of oxygen produced by the life of the oceans 520 million years ago, to the accumulation of carbon we have been pumping out into the atmosphere since James Watt patented the steam engine in April 1784. We are in discriminance of what we breathe. As Pierre Charbonnier puts it, we are breathing the ashes of modernity. All of these actualities are in a sense together in this reality we call air. Air belongs to the family of heterogeneous, multiple and massively distributed in time and space physical realities, an object that is not only life support, but produced by entanglements of life and non-life form under physical and temporal undulations. As also relates to humans, air qualify to what Timothy Morton has termed hyper objects. The growth of urban and suburban areas of Madrid from the 1980s to the present 
not only have pushed out weeds, prairies full of life in exchange for houses, shades, and engineered green carpet of single species grasses, but also have made urban and suburban users be allergic. Itchy eyes, runny nose, sneezing, coughing, short of breath, or reactions of poor uh, users for their inability of breathing, the intense red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple of the random wild prairies of Madrid. Green carpets are not only extensive post-war imaginaries, but become a noticed breathing prosthetics for less resilient human breathers. In this process of weed deterritorialization, thousands of insects and weed types that hold food webs, the nourishment of about a third of the bird species, in addition to lizards, frogs, toads, and bats, not to account for rodents and bigger mammals that produce rich air, are washed out if not killed. Killing weeds, the messengers of the forest in which to return, the producers of micro-atmosphere oxygen reached by micro-units of life, is the weaponization of air that compromises a reach to succeed. We have lost the rich air of the childhood I never learned to breathe. We have compromised air, and in return, we are becoming breathless out of the urban fields. We haven't learned enough from the short life of David Beta, trapped in a bubble for 12 years, born with a severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome. Feminist scholar and environmental humanities thinker Astrid Animanis argues that, quote, our weather making return to us as humans in multiple ways, quote, and I think will follow the breathless remind us the bad weather is a problem for all kinds of bodies, not only human ones, but for the life of air rich producers. It is a notice that our capitalist desires and imaginaries are also turning asthmatic by progressively displacing us from the room of multi-species communi communities. From a microscopic view of air, in every cubic meter, meter we breathe, we will find thousands of life forms. In this moment of the global pandemic, almost all of us acknowledge that airborne microbial life is in constant interaction with human life. But as philosopher and posthumanist thinker Monica Baca remind us, quotes, not only in a pathogenic, but also in a, in a beneficial way, quote. Every human body, cell, and respiratory system colonies of flora extended over the 540 to 810 square feet our lungs have when unfolded, half of a tennis court, contribute to a microbial exchange when breathing. Even if we cannot see it with the naked eye by breathing different bodies of air, the dry room, the wet binary, the breath of the gold or the rose garden, the frog call, the song of the Canadian geek, our internal prairies and throat oceans intertwine with other breathing beings. Moreover, paraphrasing Nimanis in her book, Bodies of, Work, of Water, our bodies of air open up and intertwine with other bodies of air with whom we share this planet. Those bodies in which we sweat, from which we inhale, in which we exhale, which graze our prairies and constitute our multitudinous companion species. The human body is a transpeace environment. The small variations of environmental conditions, wind, radiation, noise, shades, dramatically affect the reproduction cycles and behaviors of all life creatures of situated weathers. It is not only the footprint, but also the shades of the built environment that compromise our immune system by depriving, depriving topsoil to receive the necessary sun radiation. The shades of the middle-class houses of thousands of suburban developments are also prosthetics that have deprived the plants to succeed the photosynthesis. 
and decrease the oxygen level suffocating microlife of prairies that protects the topsoil. It reminds some thought that the shades of architecture not only profiled the modern beauty claimed by Le Carpusier, but also suffocated life of non-human forms. Beyond the architectural disciplinary design concerns about client prompt, design strategies and methods, program, typology, form, composition, the Toboggan House, a house designed and built from 2008 to 2016, is based on the idea of a breathing prosthetic that permits a rich to succeed. The house is surrounded by a permeable membrane of the for the well breathing of a multi-species colonies of air users into a situated environment. Artemisa pavis, bulbin, therastum, fistus, conovolbus, gaura, nepeta, lavandula, dianella, lirio, achiela, acer, gronus, citrus, weeds, all of them. The permeable membrane that surrounds the house is a prosthetic for the solar radiation to be modulated, the air to circulate softly, the noisy excitement of the nearby school teens, where I learned the meaning of situated air to be choir. The necessary light for photosynthesizers to be scattered and around at the top one house, light energy flows around underneath and top from the cosmos to the garden, while the prosthetic membrane keeps metabolisms and multi-species webs protected. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really such a delight to be here with you all um, and just to say that um, I'm having a little bit of difficulties with my internet so I'm hoping that I will stay with you and I won't um, just disappear. Um, so I'm, I'm an environmental humanities scholar trained in, in questions of um, feminist um, and cultural theory, um, queer theory, um, um, and I uh, when I was invited to, to, to think about these questions, I'm really delighted to think about this with all, with, with all of you. Um, um, so I'm very grateful for the, for the invitation. And the first thing um, that really came to my mind um, was this um, quote from uh, this beautiful poem by um, Juliana Spar um, called This Connection of Everyone with Lungs, where she writes, how connected we are with everyone, the space that has been inside of everyone, mixing inside of everyone with nitrogen and oxygen and water vapor and argon and carbon dioxide and suspended dust spores and bacteria mixing inside everyone with sulfur and sulfuric acid and titanium and nickel and minute silicon particles from pulverized glass and concrete. How lovely and how doomed this connection of everyone with lungs. And there's something about this image to me that um, that really gets at, um, for me, some of my interests and connections um, to thinking about questions of air and breathability, which I think really um, picks up really nicely on, on the things that um, both Raphael and, and Salman were, were talking about, um, which is that um, this relationship between the potentiality of understanding our, our entwined vulnerability um, and thinking about the air as a kind of um, collective commons um, or as a place of fundamental entanglement um, and this sense of being doomed. So the sense of, of um, the kind of collective, um, like the, that vulnerability working in both ways, right? Um, and clearly, obviously also um, differentially. Um, so one of the questions that I was asking myself was, what does breathing offer at this particular moment in time? And obviously, this is a deep and complex um, question, which I don't, um, which, which, which we'll, we'll talk about at length. Um, but one of the things that I was really thinking through is this relationship, this kind of tension between these two poles of vulnerability. So the pole of the commons and the pole of, of, um, of 
the precarious nature of what it means to be a creature with lungs. So to think with the atmosphere is to think about the common connections that unite all of us in the circulation of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, and I should say that, that a lot of my work is, is really interested in um, questions of climate change and especially in thinking about plastic as a kind of intimate manifestation of our relationships with fossil fuels um, and petrochemicals more broadly. Um, and so we obviously um, cannot take breathing for granted, especially in our present moment, um, as, um, as the, the other panelists have beautifully elucidated. So as Peter Sloterdijk um, has written, quote, the progressive explication of the atmosphere forces a sustained mindfulness of the air's breathability, above all in the physical sense, and then more and more in the meta metaphoric dimensions of respiration and cultural spaces. We begin to understand, and he uses this incredibly gendered language, um, it's his, not mine, um, that man is not what he eats, but what he breathes and in which he is immersed, end quote. So breathing in contemporary times reveals a deep vulnerability to the outside world, to both intended and unintended harm. Um, and I think that we can see this obviously um, through so many of the things that, that we're experiencing in relationship to the pandemic as so many other people have already pointed out. Um, what COVID is really showing us is the kinds of cracks and fault lines um, that have always been there, um, but that are maybe becoming a little bit more clear under the conditions of this, um, of this tense, intense kind of unbreathability. And as Nicholas Murzoff has, write, uh, has written, um, for example, colonialism is palpable to its worldwide populations in terms of unbreathable air. So thinking about the relationships of the manifestations of how we've conditioned the air to reflect particular kinds of social and cultural formations um, and how those then have, have um, kind of this recursive material effect on our actual bodies. So in other words, colonialism itself is a set of material conditions that often manifest through the molecular constitution of the air and air quality, um, despite its circulation, um, it's obviously not universal. Um, so um, one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in is this relationship of um, petrochemicals to questions of air um, and climate change. And in particular, um, one of the people who has been deeply inspiring um, for me to like, think through these relationships is, um, is uh, Kyle White, who has really talked about the relationship of, of climate change as not a new event, but rather the amplification and intensification of the kinds of terraforming processes that settler colonialism has always been engaged with. Um, and other, other folks like um, Isle Weisman has have taken this up, this proposition up as well. Um, and so I'm interested in the ways in which the air and, and the transformation of the biosphere more broadly um, has really resulted in the, the kind of terminology um, that Raphael was just pointing out, which is the weaponization of the air. So how does the air actually get turned into a weapon? Um, and of course, the first time the air was explicitly used as a weapon was on April 22nd, 1915, when uh, the German gas regiment launched chlorine gas against French and Canadian troops during the First World War, and here the inherent vulnerability of the body to its outside was put to the service of mass death, a slaughter produced by rendering the atmosphere unbreathable. So this weaponization of the air continued throughout the 20th century. Um, for example, in the first instance of militarized cloud seeding, um, which is the use of chemicals to produce rain clouds and control precip precipitation, the weather was used as a weapon by the U.S. Um, during Operation Popeye in Vietnam. So the proposition, although I, as far as I understand, it didn't work particularly well, but the, but the um, idea was that the jungle was made to turn against its inhabitants in an attempt to rein out the Viet Cong who used their deep knowledge of the landscape as a wartime strategy. In 1997, the United Nations Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons banned the use of any chemical weapon in warfare as an attempt to stop these kinds of explicit militarized um, practices of using the air against, against um, people. But the ironic part of this agreement is that gassing continues to be a sanctioned method of policing against dis dissenting domestic populations as tear gas is commonly used um, against protesting civilians. So this vulnerability to the outside is exploited through, exploited through warfare and other regimes of state sanctioned death. 
um, but it also perhaps more subtly and persistently is used to maintain colonial and white supremacist structures by limiting the conditions of breathability, um, especially for indigenous black and other people of color. So we often think of events in the air as natural, but it is becoming increasingly clear um, that climate change and atmospheric pollution, um, in addition to um, the pandemic, um, uh, produce very different climactic conditions for different populations. And I would argue are the deliber deliberate molecularization of colonial capitalist and extractivist politics. Um, so Christina Sharp has poignantly written um, about the ways in which atmospheres are not neutral, but can be misused as a continuation of biopolitical strategies that reduce the life expectancies and enact regimes of slow violence. For Sharp, the afterlife of slavery is, quote, the weather. And even if the country, every country, any country tries to forget, it is the atmosphere. So these atmospheres of neglect are as literal as they are metaphoric, the haunting and reverberating pleas of Eric Garner and then more recently of um, George Floyd um, as they were murdered by police um, on Staten Island and then um, in Minneapolis has become the rallying cry for the beauty and importance for the movement of black lives. And of course it wasn't just these two people, but um, many people. But, um, but Garner's death reveals another less spectacular reality. Again, um, <laughs> again, um, um, Raphael, you spoke about this as well, um, which is that Garner suffered from asthma, which is a condition that disproportionately um, affects communities of color, especially in working class and poor, poor neighborhoods. For example, children living in New York City public housing have asthma rates three times higher than for those who live in private housing. Um, as Naomi Klein has reported. Um, also, the image on your screen is actually um, an image from a petrochemical factory in um, close to Sarnia, Ontario, which is located um, and on Amjuwang First Nation. And you know, if you were to kind of um, do a little panorama and turn around, what you would see across from this petro petrochemical factory um, is literally like the playground for children. So you can obviously the the kinds of regimes. This is this is the reason why I'm arguing that these are not um, just haphazard <laughs> relations, but rather deliberate deliberate strategies um, for for certain kinds of um, suffocations. So these slow suffocations outside of the spotlight and of media and less spectacularly violent are an insidious and widespread effect of both um, what I would call differential atmospheres and also the weaponization of the atmosphere. Um, and we can also see this in relationship to the questions of plastics and plastic production, um, which of course um, we often think about in terms of the consumer end of plastic production and the harms of the petrochemicals that are produced under those conditions. Um, but it's really through the manufacturing process that most of the, the harms are really enacted and again, um, located often in indigenous and black communities. And, and also thinking about the relationship to um, the COVID pandemic, that one of the things that, that I know I've been curious about, and although I don't have any definitive um, statistics or numbers about this, is the relationship between the fact that we're all breathing in these plastic particles constantly through our masks that we're using to protect ourselves against um, COVID-19. Um, but then of course, all of this then goes back to incinerators, um, which then of course leads to, leads to worsening air condition, air, air conditions. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm happy to say more about, about plastics and, and sort of carbon um, later, but um, just to kind of signal that. So the common need to breathe, the common molecular connections that are made um, between all of us with lungs are not as common as we might like to believe or as we may wish them to be. The deferential conditions of breathability teach us that our politics are always material and are always molecular. Um, as Elias Kennedy has said in a speech for Herman Brock on the occasion of his 50th birthday, quote, to nothing is a man so open as to air. Air is the last common property. It belongs to all people collectively. And this last thing, which has belonged to all of us collectively, shall poison all of us collectively. Although Kennedy was most likely lamenting the conditions of atmospheric warfare, it's hard not to read these words today as a prophetic reading of climate change and the effects of airborne pollutants. But contained within this lament is also the assertion of the commonality of air, of the right to air, understanding the air as a, as a commons. 
For within the atmosphere, within the mundane and transcendent conditions of breathing, there's also the possibility to understand climate um, in a radically different way, to advocate and fight for an atmospheric commons, not subject to state, corporate, and military dominance. It seems more difficult to think about climate change as an external problem if we think about the ways in which um, the, sh the shift literally changes our lungs and our bodies. And so advocating for the atmospheric commons could be a radical and useful intervention into our current political impasse around the kind of inaction around climate change. So we are the air that we breathe. And this assertion is not just existential, but calls for an ethics that recognizes interdependency as the foundation of mammalian life. In drawing awareness to breathing, we are paying attention to the consequences of how we relate to air as a dumping ground for carbon dioxide and methane and particulate matter, or as a connection to our ancestors, other creatures, the land and water as the very core of our being. And so in some ways, I think that what we're witnessing in relationship to using the air as a kind of dumping ground for, for petrochemicals um, and for other kinds of um, chemical militarized contaminants is an ontological misrecognition of the category of the individual to begin with, right? So that, so that if we think of ourselves as, um, as an individual, as a sealed off possibility for a container, which I would argue is also kind of that kind of logic is embedded within um, within the materiality of plastic, then we miss, then it becomes easy to understand why we would put all these toxicants out into the world. Um, but as the other panelists have so beautifully elucidated, um, the ways in which we think about our fundamental entanglement and the fact that we cannot actually escape the fact of our connection to everybody, um, and by everybody, I mean all the beings um, that. Um, that, that if we reoriented our kind, of, our kind of politics of being around that, then I think it would become much, much more difficult to, um, to justify these kinds of um, continued colonial measures in terms of climate change and, and the, the explicit use of petrochemicals. So I'll stop there. Okay, thanks so much, Heather, Raphael, and Salman. Um, we are going to um, get into conversation now. And as uh, Liz and I do that with some questions for our panelists, so many things to think about and so many wonderful cross connections. I just want to remind um, the audience, you can post questions, comments in the Q&A function. Um, many of you are very familiar with Zoom webinars at this point. For, the, for those of you who are not, please just look down at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A, and you can post things there. And Liz and I will keep an eye on those and bring them into conversation. Um, so maybe Liz, I'll ask you if you want to sort of jump in first with a question or uh, with a kind of comment to start tying things together. Apparently, I um, I keep starting my my spiel before unmuting. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'd love to um, go ahead and, and jump in. Uh, one of the things that really struck me as um, as the three of you were talking was this 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 idea of of the interior and the exterior this kind of relationship between an interiority and an exteriority uh, i think uh salman like you you started talking about these um these beautiful idea of of the the thermal cascade right and there's uh this this idea of a kind of gradient or a slower transition uh, uh, an entanglement between what might be a semi-interior and a semi-exterior. Uh, with uh, Raphael's project, I can't help but think about the um, the kind of wrapper around these volumes as a as a kind of mediative threshold. And then I think this uh, idea of of our human and our kind of vulnerability as beings that that breathe to to that exterior and, and this concept of the individual and and uh thinking about thresholds and enclosures i just wanted to kind of open up the conversation to talk about the um the kind of i think we would all agree the impossibility of of any kind of environmental bubble and why i think that the conversation around air as a medium becomes a really provocative one through which uh, we might enter uh, the, the conversation around climate change, right? Since um, 
1986 uh, Risk Society written by Ulrich Beck, you know, talks about how basically we are uh, confronting the, the, the kind of byproducts of, of our modernity, right? And so I think um, maybe if we could uh, start by trying to entangle or unpack these kinds of um, ideas of uh, a kind of capitalist society and air as a as a kind of medium that um, that note that that becomes a kind of uh, notational system for um, uh, for for that uh, kind of uh, economic system and uh, and how the idea of a of a perceived interiority perhaps is actually uh, detrimental to our the kind of anxiety that we should perhaps be feeling to to our vulnerability to this exterior, right? Because I would say like everything is all everything is either interior or, or exterior. There's a uh, I, I, I almost want to kind of like dismantle the idea that there can be an interior or an exterior, but it's so embedded in the way in which we think about a built environment and the kind of uh, containment of, of a favorable climactic condition. So I just wanted to, I can open it up to, um, to each of you maybe to think, to think about or respond to this idea of of interior and exterior. Thank, thank you so much, Liz. I think I think you're spot on there. Right, um, the, the, the sort of the the sharp line between an interior and an exterior, uh, as a as a as a sort of membrane or or envelope or everything is 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 squashed into to something uh, less than a meter wide. Um, is something that needs to to be challenged, I I believe, and it's a it's it's a uh, it's a reflection of uh, a modern approach to designing uh, environments, um, but also I think of the supply chain and how and how how uh, building assemblies are ordered and and um, organized and how knowledge um, is fragmented across the industry as well. Um, it's also it's also a division between um, an assumption between public and private space uh, uh, as well. So that that's um, that's the um, political ground, and especially I'd say in um, uh, North America, it's hard harder to um, Im imagine a, a gradient of of exterior to interior spaces and public to uh, and public to private spaces uh, as well as a soft as a soft as a softer gradient um but it wasn't always thus i mean if you if um um you know it wasn't um you, you could i mean rafael could probably um uh, um summarize the 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 line of architectural history uh, better than i could but the um you could go back as far as the the 15th century uh, to the first appearance of corridors as a device for removing traffic uh, from rooms and and you know before then all interior space was was designed as more of a, a matrix of interconnected spaces um, which would more naturally generate uh, different thermal thermal zones and 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 temperature and temperature cascades and, and environments and, and a much more a, a soft softer gradient um, uh, between human life and all and, and biological life <laughs> um, uh, as well. I'm not 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 um, uh, um, so so that, that, that there's there's a lot to be said there and 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 then the yeah just a, a little bit more um, th this this idea of 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 the the envelope um, and and the sharp delineation of of inner and outer space you know it we it can't and living in a bubble it's just it's just not possible going to be possible for everyone in the world to live like that um, energetically possible and um, yeah, we don't have enough um, uh, we can't afford all that all the refrigerants um, to be able to do that um, so so it's it, so we have to challenge that that notion and think of ways of of, of, of designing gradients um, and not thinking about these this universal inside outside solution uh, um, uh, uh, for all for all instances yes. 
yeah, as much as as much as they can talk from the standpoint of architecture and um, I think I think we are we're we're in need of challenging a, 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 a deep deep structures of our own internalized structures of knowledge, power, and laws and regulations and many underlying system of um, ways of uh, of understanding what 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 is this uh, confrontation between the object and the subject because it rooted uh, our inability of, of of thinking out of some um, limits or some let's say the idea of the limit the idea of the of the of the scheme as a limit instead of the scheme as a zone of interaction and negotiation and so on. So uh, in this regard, I feel that uh, challenging the idea of interior and exterior as a design practice is, is, uh, is, is necessary, I think. I learned a lot from Sal uh, in one of his presentation when he explained to us how to build a breathable wall uh, and how the wall will permit the temperature to adequate from outside to the inside and how many uh, challenges uh, technology as such will have to confront uh, laws, regulations, and you know, systems that we have been building for many centuries to understand or to organize our, our structures. As I mentioned before, laws, regulation, the deep uh, the structures of powers and wealth and so on, because it's very difficult for, for us to, um, as a, as a, as a, as humanity, uh, think beyond what is this confrontation between um, the limits of the objects and the limits of the subjects and so on. So I, I think that there is something there that is that is interesting to me, but also provoke me a vertigo, because of as much as you try to 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 dissolve boundaries, you you have to change many other structures of of knowledge and power and so on. I would like to just to drop that um, it was it was 90, 1928 when um, um, Siegfried Evelyn uh, did something amazing, which was trying to understand the human body you no know, uh, from a plastic perspective, but from a plasmatic perspective. And he wrote a manifesto that he dropped on the table of Walter Gropius. The, 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 when Walter Gropius was funding, funding the, the, the Bauhaus and building these, you know, knowledge uh, and plastical knowledge and creative knowledge that we are absolutely trapped into. And he was challenging the whole idea of, of the limits and, you know, our ways of looking things. And he was saying that we shouldn't paint the walls. We should illuminate and use the energy of the sun to change this spectrum of colors that led him to write a uh, manifesto that was space as membrane, as if a space were not gonna be any more interior or exterior, but, but a kind of a scheme that goes and negotiates from the outside to the, in, to the out, outer, to the inner part of a body that could be also projected to this idea of more, uh, let's say, Gilbert Simondon thinking that what about if we think our body no, as an object, but as a, a skin that negotiates from the outside temperature interchange to the inside where the body becomes mineral, mineralized as a, as a skeleton. So the skeleton is not other thing that is thicker, stronger, and compacted skin. If we see the body as a skin, it's a different thing as if we see the body as an object. And if we trade the body as a skin, as a permeable trans transparency to some fluxes, then we will radically understand a different uh, beings uh, because we, be, we will be transparent to other beings and so on. So there, there is something there that I, I never arrived to uncouple strongly, but I think is, I don't know, maybe, maybe Heather have better tools than I have to talk about that, but just dropping these to Heather, I think. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that like one of the a couple of things that really came to mind when you were talking about the questions of interiority and exteriority um, 
is the concept of, of transcorporeality from Stacey Alimo, who like really thinks about that kind of um, relationship of how the body is the outside and the outside is the body, but that there is still some, obviously some kind of a division, but like what that div division is, is not so strict. Um, or um, Nancy Tuana also has a concept of um, viscous porosity that I think is also useful um, in thinking about that kind of like, kind of the ways in which the body is always like in process and, and kind of always decomposing and recomposing itself right <laughs> throughout throughout our lives um, and and I think that that's really useful um, in terms of thinking about our interconnections um, with other um, beings and other um, systems like hy hydrospheric systems and um, atmospheric systems and I also think about a lot the um, Rachel Lee has this beautiful concept called the fiction of comfort and I think that what she's trying to get at with that is the um, is this the ways in which um, there's a kind of misunderstanding of um, what industrial toxicants are, which is you know the thing that that I often think about, um, and so and petrochemical um, petrochemical kind of saturation. Um, so thinking about the ways in which like there's a misunderstanding of what those um, what those materials are to begin with, but I think that like certain bodies are rendered. Um, disposable, but that means that for those of us who don't occupy that position, that there's somehow a belief that we won't actually be affected. And I think that there's something similar in relationship happening with climate change, right, which is that there's like certain groups that are kind of like rendered and made fungible. Um, but that, but that within that, um, there's a kind of belief that somehow those of us with enough um, power and wealth and, and privilege of other kinds um, will somehow um, not be vulnerable to those harms. And I think that there's a lot of um, theorists and people obviously on the ground who are really pushing back against these notions um, and, and thinking about this in particular, um, you know, Michelle Murphy has, has long been um, writing about these questions um, and think, writing about the ways in which, you know, if you have something like a colonial atmosphere it's going to affect all of us right it might affect us differently it might take longer for it to reach the people who have um, more power and wealth and and um and, a, and, a, and access to to certain kinds of barricades but that doesn't mean it won't in fact reach us um, and in some ways it might render us um, less capable of, of adaptation um, than other people um, but uh but that also, I mean, um, Rachel Lee also discusses the ways in which like the fiction of comfort um, provides kind of psychic cover um, for, for like elite subjects, right? So that, so that because of this, we can somehow think that this is not our responsibility or, or our, um, our really, like we don't have to actually think about these things because this happens to other people in other places, right? Um, and uh, maybe just as a total aside, one of the things that I've, I've been, I've been also thinking about is the ways in which um, the kind of sealing, this kind of desire for everything to be so sealed in, it's like so beautiful to hear about um, your projects, Raphael and Sal, because, um, you know, I, I love this idea of these, these um, breathing buildings and, and all of these different kinds of historical and contemporary examples of how that happens, because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm, I, I, I believe that also the, the ways in which buildings are sealed off can often be a source of indoor air pollution, right? Like that through, and also through the, the kinds of things that we use to, to seal those things off. So um, all of the kinds of petrochemicals that are inbuilt into, into different kinds of housing systems, the formaldehydes, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the plastic paints, you know, all of this stuff, which I understand is, is better than lead paint, but nonetheless, right? it's kind of like, it's really beautiful to hear about this Bauhaus example of like thinking about the sun instead of this kind of constant use of, of, um, of petrochemicals in our indoor environments as if they were completely benign or as if like that kind of, like that, that mentality of sealing was what was gonna keep us safe when in fact, it seems to be more and more that actually, that doesn't keep us safe at all. It, it renders us much more, um, it can render us much more sick. 
You know, I think something that's really um, wonderfully coming out of this conversation um, it has to do with the way, I mean, to come back to something that um, Heather said earlier, if, if part of the importance is to imagine there's a kind of atmospheric commons, it's also important to understand that we don't all breathe the same air, same air right? That air is incredibly situated and particularized, right? And, and you all have different ways of thinking through those possibilities. Um, and I kind of want to tie that to a couple of the conver um a couple of the questions and comments that are coming in through the Q&A. I encourage anyone else who wants to post one to please do so. Um, so we have a couple um, fascinating sort of conversations about what does it mean to think about um, Maybe you could say, what are what are our tools? What are what what helps us think about this distinction between the desire for a certain kind of atmospheric comments, which we would love to imagine everyone gets to breathe healthy, clean air all the time, and the incredibly situated nature of of air, which has to do with long and often bad histories, that has to do with sort of um, sort of access, that has to do with right the means to have the comfortable life, where you could kind of um, try to create the atmosphere you want around you, right through 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 sort of expenditure and through technology. Um, and we've got kind of interesting questions about, well, how do we think about that in terms of our teaching, but also, especially for architects, how do we think about that in terms of client demands, that these are very much social problems and not just sort of design problems. I'm, I'm just going to say quickly a couple of things that I noted as you were all talking and then just invite you all to kind of think a little bit about, about that. Um, you know, I was really so fascinated by the idea that for you, um, history and something you refer to as vernacular knowledge is really important as a way of trying to figure out that sort of commons versus specified sort of versions of air. Um, and for Raphael, I was really struck by this term, term situated air that you used, but also the idea that we're often tangled up with what air is versus what it should be, that that sometimes is also a kind of uh, problem for us. Um, and Heather, of course, thinking through all the conceptual and historical sort of uh, inheritance that are still in the air with us, you know, you open the door and feel like you get this sort of fresh air that's right now, but really traveling with it are these long, long standing currents, you know, most of which are still interfering. So in a sense, um, yeah, I'd love to hear how you think about how we teach for, how we talk to clients, how we talk to all sorts of people about this desire for kind of the atmospheric comments we need, maybe right now. Maybe, maybe as as much as I am uh, working deeply in curriculum, I feel, I feel I feel attracted by this question. But I think it's important for us to understand also how big is this challenge. As much as, for example, if we are acknowledging that air as we know it now is one hundred twenty six years old in science versus gold that has been technically used by humans for more than four thousand years. So that explains the difference that can also explain why the solid matter has been at the core of philosophy, like philosophers have kept themselves grounded instead of uh, in fluid matters. And that that can explain to you the Western culture is, is a strain to understand water, uh, or being on water, or being on fire, or being on air, as 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 Lucy Idigaray will will explain us in 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 his revision of Martin Heidegger, uh, and the work of Martin Heidegger, uh, this this work that she brought that was uh, for uh, the forgetting of her, which I want just to put in front of us that look, uh, air has been with us as we know after. Uh, William Ramsey in, in, in 1894 um, trapped argon, and then the composition of her was already in front of us as a, as a scientific uh, object. It, it is 126 years old. And, and, and that means that how much we have to construct to understand the, a different way of us related to other than the solid. Uh, environment. So the solid also bring to us uh, physical um, attraction. We can we can touch it. We can fix it. We can understand these things. So how do we explain to us this first, and then how do we translate to a critical thinking? Of course, there are lines of work that are already theor theorized by, by many uh, incredible scholars that are already digging down and using uh, multiple. 
ways of approaching it from the techniques, from the science, from the aesthetics. Um, I think uh, as much as we can represent it uh, in multiple ways, one of my, uh, I'm, I'm very careful with this thing in my research and my, and my design works is as how do we visualize, how do we visible the invisible, how do we tangible the intangible, uh, error is one of the most important challenge. How do we construct error or how do we use error as a construction material? Uh, knowing the way we use bricks, and I think in this, uh, this topic, it is a big repository of other things. And pedagogically or curricularly, uh, this is, um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a big is a big challenge and question. Uh, and I think we might need to start digging down in anthropological uh, observation of what do we understand uh, by uh, these elements that other cultures uh, are very deep into and we are not acknowledging their knowledge as, as something to be used like you know deep Amazonians uh, communities are, are living and talking to plants and listening to them in a very specific way and uh, in that capacity they have the, developed a huge uh, understanding of others, otherness and other beings and these transmissions and things. So I think curricularly, I think anthropology will be a good element to look at uh, closely and understand other ways of, 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 of thinking uh, the otherness uh, beyond Western culture. And that's why I was bringing before this, this big structure of of elements that are absolutely on top of every definition we try to build. And again, going back uh, just and circulating around, like air is with us for no more than 126 years. And that is kind of ironic, if not uh, terrifying, as much as we inhale every second to survive and produce ourselves. And, and that's why, uh, I don't know, architecturally, uh, I found that, that, that idea of the skin and how the skin, but I learned recently that the multi-layer skins, as Solomon taught me before, is not also a good alliance. <laughs> if, instead of looking for more monolithic or monomaterial capacities, and, I, and, I, and, I, and there we are in this moment. So. But I think the, the the sort of uh, insight really for me is 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 that it's as much about spatial design and and materials design and 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 fluid mechanics design to to together um, uh, to be able to 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 design these different environments and and not not in the way that you can arbitrarily um, design spaces and then and then use mechanical systems to set whatever temperature or or, or what have you in a in a way that um some some architects uh, do today but to to actually uh, un understand the, the laws of thermodynamics and 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 how how heat moves from hot to cold and and how how air flows from uh, from uh, um, from high pressure to low pressure, and and to be able to to to, to work with these, um, the 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 thing that um, the issue that um, Heather raised for me about uh, Ed, for the fight for atmospheric commons and that Joseph and Raphael have just underlined, I think, is so 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 important, um, is an analogy with the, the the right to clean water and as a, as as a as a public right, and there's a there's a vested interest to. To technology only solutions for internal in environments because because it because it means then then our our our, our, gov our governments don't need to to, to worry about um, cleaning up cities and towns and 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 um, and not worrying that that um, they're, they're polluted <laughs> um, with um, with cars etc. Um, so you can't. There's only so much that you can do with with architectural design and and natural flows of of heat and air. Um, if 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 your if if your uh, local um, area is 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 air polluted, right? So you need to 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 have naturally ventilated buildings and such. You also need uh, clean 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 air in and around. Uh, this is is vitally important. And then then you can start actually uh, doing things with, without uh, without uh, without equipment and using and 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 technology and 
and material sourced up from arbitrarily across a, across a global supply chain. Um, the, the, you, you summarized nicely, Joseph, the, 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 the questions and the, uh, and the connections between the questions that I've, I've, uh, I, I see here. I'll, 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 just, I'll just try and quickly ad address each, each in turn. I, I think um, uh, Raphael spoke a bit to, to Samam's question um, about, about um, uh, pedagogy and, and, and the, 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 many people are, are, are thinking very deeply about how to readdress the curriculum. Um, Raphael is one of them. We, we um, um, in, in just in my studio last, last semester, and we'll do it again uh, next semester, we're, 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 we're teaching architects how to design in the north without uh, mechanical air conditioning or heat recovery using, using um, the, the principles of, of temperature cascades and being able to, to, to get uh, heat recovery with natural ventilation so you can obviate those mechanical systems and then and then being able to design with local materials and bio-based materials so you can store carbon the only um, in, in in building um, uh, structures but it's you you have to first uh, impart the physical imagination in the in the minds of architects first so so they have they have to have an imagination about how how air flows in in buildings and how it's powered by buoyancy and and for that there there's has to be a shift in the education in in, in North America especially I'm not, not saying uh, but it, and uh, in other places of the world as well there's a there's a deep split um, uh, between the, the the curriculum of design and the and the, and the curriculum of equipment and uh, and and that's how it's um, that's how it's set and it, and it and it carries through into the industry um, but it doesn't have to be that way and and, and there, there, there should be a curriculum based based more on uh, principles and and on the environmental imagination around those uh, principles and and there are many people uh, doing that and and Saman, I would I would uh, I would look around at, at at, at schools that are, are offering that that kind of uh, uh, um, needed approach. I saw that um, Kenneth asked about about the, the cultural constraints of, of of comfort, and and Heather spoken about uh, about um, comfort very eloquently. Um, I just say that yeah, I think I agree with you that it's as it's as much, if not more, a, a social challenge, uh, uh, so to speak, rather than a, than a, than a, than, a, than a technical one. Um, uh, to 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 break any habit is a is a is is a challenge, but that's that's I think the 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 agenda of architecture to 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 imagine um, uh, not that uh, to imagine the uh, the the kinds of different habits of life possible and different kinds of um, social interaction and different kinds of pleasures of, of um, possible with thermally heterogeneous uh, environments um, and and it's a it's a very rich area once you start to to, to scratch it and um, so I think that's um, that's part of our architects duty to think about that and to imagine and to imagine the problem is that that nobody can really imagine it otherwise because uh, because we're all living in our bubbles so so um, it, it's 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 a challenge of imagination to and then, and then, lastly, um, uh, Sarah Kan Kantorowicz, I think I think I know who you are. Um, if if it is you, then then uh, great to, to hear from you again. Um, uh, if it, it might be an ex student of mine, and I hope she's doing well. But the, um, about the example of biomanufacturing facilities with vaccines and 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 basically special building types that 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 really do need. Um, enclosed interiors and and it's just to say that we need to move beyond totalizing ideas of of one solution fits all there are some building types which which just need to be designed like space shuttles like <laughs> that's for sure um but but not not every kind of building and um you know some 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 are, are architects that to um to, to point to for for, for Sarah, but Sarah and Kenneth it, Kenneth might be Famously, Lakatan and Vassal, who who uh, masterfully design these different um, um, environments, um, from the um, interior to the quasi interior to the quasi quasi exterior, but also mostly don't overprogram these spaces, so so that 
so that or over determine their their use so so that they're they're conceived of as free spaces and it there there's an a, a sort of an emergence of 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 um occurrences in those spaces um and and a poetics about them that um yeah that's the area that that architects can can really think about um yeah and it, it, every building being different and and sort of not not and, and a non-universality to, to their approach I love that you've brought us back to imagination and poetics, back to Bachelard in a way. So maybe this is a way of queuing up um, Heather for a kind of last word since we're um, getting to the end of our time. Um, Heather, would you like to say something? Sure, I'm happy to. Yeah, definitely around the question of, I think, environmental imaginaries. Um, I think that that's um, super important. I mean, one of the um, quotes that's kind of like stayed with me was um, Uthant on the occasion of the first Earth Day, where he said that um, we don't want to, in 50 years or 100 years looking back, um, say that, that, um, that we ran out of food, air, and um and ideas and i think that like that is that's super interesting to me right that um that that he would say that it really i think points to the importance of fields like architecture and design in relationship to questions of of um climate change or, or um more localized air pollution um but yeah one of the one of the one of the artists that often um that i often draw inspiration from and in, in thinking about the kinds of questions of of um, the air as a commons is Amy Balkin's um, project um, Public Smog, where she um, proposed to um, she proposed two things. One, where she literally bought a, a bunch of um, uh, pollution um, offsets on on the market, and then. Um, uh, didn't use them, right? And so there's there's some there's a more eloquent word for that, but I've forgotten what it is what it's called. Um, but uh, but and I you know and I often think about this. I you know I often sort of ask my students about this. It's like, well, what if we did this on a much more massive scale as a kind of activist action, right? What if there was thousands of citizens who went and bought these um, bought these pollutant quotas that you can buy on on just the regular trading markets and and just didn't use them right that it would significantly improve or it has the possibility at, at certain scales of, of potentially improving um kind of localized air quality which also of course has a has a larger um, impact in terms of um, carbon emissions more broadly um, and then the other thing that she proposed was to um, make the atmosphere um a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, which is obviously like a little bit more tongue in cheek as a proposition. And she wrote these like beautiful letters to everybody who's on the um, UNESCO committee and nobody wrote her back. <laughs> um, but uh, except for I think one one person um, from a, a low lying um, island nation state, I'm forgetting which one. Um, but uh, but you know, which which I think like goes to show the kinds of like effort that is possible, right? In terms of in terms of addressing these things, I think one of the things actually around questions of habit um, that the last couple of years has really shown us is that we can make major societal pivots um, extremely rapidly if the need arises, right? And I think that the question that for a lot of us we've been kind of trying to figure out is like how do we how do we make something like climate change have that sense of um, um, importance right and so um, to, to do these kinds of things um, and to, to reorient ourselves to, to maybe a different sense of aesthetics and atmospheric relations um, to thinking about things like the kind of questions of, of comfort in, in different um, in different um, places or, or these kinds of um, relations of, of um, heat and and cold and you know all of all of these kinds of questions but also to think I think about the question I often also think about um, the ways in which um, you know so Bangkok energy has has sort of asked us to think about like what if we narrated the kind of birth of the environmental movement within North America um, through the um, through the the story of um, of the resistance um, to uh, Project Chariot, which was meant to take place um, on Indigenous land in in Alaska, um, and and the the in the 1950s where they were going to explode a nuclear bomb up there and it was going to obviously be incredibly devastating for the ecology of the area and the, and the folks in the and in, in the community and i'm sorry i'm forgetting the the, the nation's name but um but they you know 
launched this incredible resistance against basically the US government and won, right? And what if that would be the kind of model for, for thinking through the kind of birth of the environmental movement, right? Instead of the kind of um, resistance that the kind of builds out of a kind of more um, like NIMBY-like focus, right? So um, the relationship of, of kind of self-protection in relationship to the, to the environment, not wanting to have a certain kind of relationship to personal toxicity, again, kind of like this logic of pure that I think is built into some strands of the environmental movement. What if instead it was really about um, saving these saving these ecologies and, and really understanding the power of of um, of local community action, even like, even in sort of insurmountable odds. Um, and I think that that it for me is like a very inspiring way of thinking and reorienting. Um, and again, you know, picking up on what Raphael was saying that, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, it's now even been recognized by the United Nations that that um, indigenous sovereignty is is one of the most important things when it comes to the environmental movement, right? So, um, so really thinking about like, how do we um, think about questions of land back? How do we think about questions of, of, um, of anti-colonial um, relations to, to the land. Um, I think that those things are central um, to rethinking our orientations to climate and to land, to, to the air in general. Um, and uh, you know, those are difficult <laughs> ongoing questions. It's not easy, but I do think that um, there's a lot of movement behind them. There's a lot of knowledge um, as, as Raphael was saying that, um, that we've um, been ignored or, or rather like suppressed and oppressed um, for many centuries now. And, and what if we just stopped doing that, <laughs> right? <laughs> kind of like, what if we just stopped subsidizing fossil fuels? <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, there's, I think there's, there's some things that, that I realize are difficult to convince politicians to do because of um, the massive amounts of money that they get from these industries. <laughs> but, uh, but, but there is a certain way in which, you know, sometimes just stopping doing something is incredibly helpful. Um, you don't even have to do anything else. Yeah, in a way, I think a really incredible place to end. What if we had the imagination to stop doing certain things, right? Um, anyway, I we, uh, I want to thank everyone for for staying with us for this fantastic conversation. It's a testament to how interesting it's been that everyone stayed so late, um, and we're really grateful for your time. I want to thank um, Solomon and Raphael and Heather for their incredible contributions. It's been great to organize this with um, with Liz and with, with Wan Ho, and I'm looking forward to more such conversations in the future. I'll just say quickly, keep an eye out for. A couple more planet now is this spring um march 23rd at 6 p.m um justice in the food system um a great conversation there and another on april 11th um about a documentary called we still here thinking about puerto rico in the wake of hurricane maria thanks so much have a good have a healthy have a clean air breathing <laughs> night um, and we'll see you again bye bye everyone mm -hmm.